Hello, everyone. I, I think we're we're live now on uh, Zoom on the internet, and um, we're just going to wait a moment or two as as uh, people trickle in. But uh, thank you for joining and welcome. We're uh, we're on standby just for about a, a one or two minutes. Give people a chance to to get their Zooms set up and and come in and join the meeting. So welcome and thank you and standing by for just a moment or two. Again, thank you for everyone that's uh, that's joining in. We're um, we're live, and we're just going to wait a, a minute, uh, maybe two minutes, for everybody to to get in, get their video and their microphone set, and get used to to the Zoom platform. I know that we're not all experts at it. Certainly, I'm not. So <laughs> please be uh, patient with us. I've got my cool North Sales zoom background on and it's actually Waz's boat behind me and <laughs> Vincent looks like he has his zoom background on as well so that's uh, that's his boat behind him but uh, thank you for joining we're just gonna give it about uh, 30 more seconds then we'll go ahead and start up uh, start up the call Welcome to the people that are continuing to join. We're just uh, just about to start here. What do you think, uh, Vincent Waza? Should we should we start fire this yep. thing up? Yep, good to yep. go. Okay. All right. Well, here we go, guys. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for for joining. Uh, North Sales Cruising webinar. We have a, a large group of people that have uh, signed up and are gathering on the call today, and I'm uh, really excited to be your, your moderator. My name is Bill Fortenberry, and I'm speaking to you today from Newport, Rhode Island. And uh, our weather here in Newport is finally getting nice, so it's uh, it's feeling like sailing season where I live, and I hope it's feeling like sailing season where where you live as well. We just had a gorgeous uh, three-day weekend here in Newport and the weather was beautiful and people were back out on their boats and sailing. So pretty exciting time here in my town that uh, everyone's really looking forward to getting back out on the water with, with friends and family. So uh, that's where I'm sitting. Again, my name is Bill Fortenberry and I'm in Newport, uh, Rhode Island. Uh, before we begin the webinar, um, just a small disclaimer. Um, this webinar is really not intended to be an all-encompassing how-to go cruising seminar. This idea is much more about having a conversation with two friends of North Sales and learning about cruising through their experiences and, and how they like to cruise and, and how they've been cruising. Um, each of our guests today are highly experienced sailors who have unique and interesting um, cruising experiences. I think you're going to really enjoy uh, meeting our guests. Um, but we do hope to touch on technical topics like sales and sale choices and trimming and technique, but also to learn uh, how each of our guests goes about sailing in their own way. So this really isn't intended to be a North U seminar on the right way to tack, but it's going to touch on, um, you know, cruising through the lens of our guests. Um, I learned a long time ago that the best way to get better at sailing is to go sailing with uh, more experienced or talk to more experienced sailors. And today's webinar is really built around that idea. So we only have an hour to uh, meet and listen to our guests. So, so let's go ahead and begin. Um, welcome to Vincent Moyersons and uh, Warwick Kerr. Waza, that's going to be the only time I call you Warwick on the, on the call. So um, I don't know if anyone calls you Warwick, but you're going to hear me talk uh, to Waza today. Um, and uh, Vincent is joining us from his home in 
Stowe, Vermont. And Waz is joining us uh, from a friend's home in St. Martin, where he's uh, presently birthed while cruising and living aboard uh, with his family. So welcome, guys. Would you like to say hi to our group? And do you have any initial comments? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hi, everyone. Beautiful okay. day here. Okay, loud and clear. We got your audio, video. Everything's working uh, good so far. So as I mentioned, Vincent and Waz are both excellent and experienced sailors. Vincent uh, was born in Brussels, uh, but now lives in Stowe, Vermont. And uh, his background as a sailor is quite interesting uh, because um, in a former life, he was the chief operating officer of an America's Cup team uh, and won the 1992 America's Cup as the COO of America Cubed. Um, he's also a veteran of the Whitbread Around the World race, back when it was called the Whitbread Vincent. You're showing our, our age when we call it the Whitbread these days. Um, uh, but also um, uh, a veteran of maxi yacht racing and super yacht regattas. He is a multiple time world champion sailor in, in maxis and 12 meters. But he's also cruised extensively before owning his, uh, his current uh, uh, cruising boat that we're gonna learn about, Alioth. And last summer, uh, Vincent was one of 17 boats to sail the Northwest Passage, which is just an amazing experience that we're going to learn a little bit about today. So uh, Vincent Moyerson, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining. Did I get most of that right? Yeah, that's great, Bill. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Thank you for Okay. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit more about your sailing background. Anything else you'd, you'd want to add to that as, as maybe as a kid growing up? sailing, family, like where does your passion for sailing come from? Yeah, I was lucky because our parents had a small boat in the southern part of Holland, in one of the brackish lakes there. And I grew up there as a young child uh, uh, sailing and then I became a uh, dinghy instructor in my teens, early teens in France. Uh, and then after that cruising instructor and that kind of led to deliveries across the Atlantic and then the the Whitbread race in 1981, participating in that, and that led to the Maxis and on and on. Uh, and, and you know, I, I did that professionally until uh, I guess 95, 96. And at that point, uh, my daughter was born, and uh, I had switched modes. I went to be an, an entrepreneur in Massachusetts and did a few small technical technology companies uh, to be able to be closer to home, basically. Outstanding, no. outstanding. So you're, you're in cruise mode now. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Vincent. Um, Waza Kerr um, is originally from uh, Australia, and he was uh, born and raised in a little town called Cairns. And if you don't know where Cairns is on the north coast of Australia, it's that little pointy uh, thing on the top of Australia. Right, Waza? It's like pointing up at Papua New Guinea, I think. Yep. Up that way. So, yeah, so uh, go to the Gold Coast and, and keep going. Um, but but Waz has uh, been a sailmaker uh, for two uh, Volvo Ocean Racing teams. He's been a sailmaker on uh, one America's Cup team. He's won the Sydney Hobart race. And he's actually a former employee of North Sales who's on a open-ended hiatus. We don't know when uh, or if he'll come back, Waza. But um, Waz has been a, a, a sail expert for North Sales for, for a number of years in, um, in Palma, Mallorca. Um, and um, just recently uh, jumped into the cruising lifestyle last year um, with, his, with his wife and family. Was a, um, they tell me you also like to cycle, golf, and kite surf. I, I know you got your kites on your boat. I don't know about, about bikes and, and golf clubs. Um, but kind of the same question for you, Waza. Did, did I get that right? And, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, your background from, from your perspective. Yeah, it's the same. All that's pretty accurate. And we, I started sailing uh, when I was eight years old or something. A mate of mine from school dragged me along um, to go sailing after school one day. And I took it on and got into the local yacht club, bit of competitive sailing. And then as time went on, I ended up stumbling into a sail making apprenticeship. Um, and then I sort of went, did a bit of time here and there, and I ended up in New Zealand for a bit at, um, at a loft there. Not Norse, was another company. And then um, ended up being taught, having, just having a beer with a guy who knew a guy who was 
involved with one of the Volvo teams and I ended up as a sailmaker for that team and each each project kind of leads into the next project and suddenly you find yourself on a super yacht in Palmer 20 years later and wandering around being involved with stuff and it's and, and, and now you're sitting in the Caribbean um, with with your family on the, on yeah. the Wilco. Yeah, there. exactly. Okay, well, um, that's the introduction, guys. This is, this is our guest. I really am proud to have both of um, uh, both of these guys on, on the call today. I, I consider them both uh, close friends and uh, really have a lot of respect for, for both of them as, as sailors. So um, let's just move on uh, from here and just start talking about your boats. Um, on the left here is uh, Vincent's boat. Uh, Alioth. It's an Azuro 53, uh, built in 2009 and designed by uh, Barrett uh, and Rapico uh, Yacht Design. Uh, on the right is Waz's boat. Um, that's a Spirit 36 called Wakaki, uh, designed by Jacques de Ritter. And it was built in Belgium in the maybe beginning in the late 1980s. So we, we had kind of have a, a Belgium theme going on here, uh, Vincent. Uh, with uh, Waz's boat and, and your background. So um, maybe we'll have a Belgium uh, beer after this thing's over. But um, uh, in any case, these are the two boats. And I think we'll just go right into uh, li listening to Vincent, maybe tell us a little bit more about um, Alio, the Azura 53 footer. I've got a few slides here, um, Vincent, but just tell us about your boat, You know what you like about it, why you bought it, what are some of the key characteristics and attributes and I'll go through a couple of the pictures but you can speak to the slide or just kind of tell us about your boat. Sure well just a little background about nine or ten years ago um, six of us did a, a, a two-week trip down in the canals in Patagonia and around Cape Horn um, on, a, on a charter boat uh, down there and that kind of sealed the uh, the deal to try to put something together. My brother and I have been talking about this for a long time and we own the boat together with a third partner who's not sailing anymore, but um, so it's really the two of us. Um, and we, lo we looked for a couple of years for a boat. Um, we had some requirements. We wanted a aluminum boat um, with a raised salon, um, a relatively light and fast boat with, with some kind of a shallow draft option. Um, so we end up with this boat. This boat was just five years old when we bought it. Uh, two other brothers had built it and sailed it around the world over five years. Um, and there, there was five of these boats built. This is number four. And unfortunately, the yard uh, in 2009 uh, went into bankruptcy after, after building the final boat. A great boat, a lift keel, a twin rudders, um, a light boat, 12 and a half tons empty, quite quite light for its for its size, uh, very safe, um, well insulated. Um, what else do we have? We had the boat um, uh, when we got it. We 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 did a, a full refit on it. We added the the, the dog house. Uh, we upgraded the electronics. We obviously upgraded some of the sails. Um, and then eventually we converted the uh, water ballast tanks into fuel tanks. The boat has two uh, 300 gallon uh, water ballast tanks that we rarely use. Um, and we end up converting them in fuel tanks, which give us now a fuel autonomy of about 3000 miles, uh, which is really useful for the, the kind of uh, sailing that we want to, that we're doing with the boat. We had two goals with uh, the purchase of the boat. One of them was to go to places where you cannot charter a boat. Uh, so we, we visit places like the northern part of Norway. Um, uh, we've, we've been around Iceland with it. And, uh, and then last year we did uh, you know, Greenland, Northwest Passage, Alaska. Um, and then the other goal for us was to share the experience with family and friends. Um, so we were never uh, we never planned to live on board uh, the boat full time. We spent two to sometimes three months a year on the boat, um, and over over the five years that we've owned it, we've had more than a hundred crew members. Uh, we try to kind of select crew members based on availability and 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 people people that we know and appreciate and that we can share kind of special experiences with. Um, it's been a great boat for us. It's, it, it, it's really been a, 
a good, reliable, safe uh, boat. It's very quiet also, it's very well insulated, so it's very quiet uh, in rough seas. Um, and and uh, to date, its biggest challenge, of course, was the Northwest Passage has performed very well on that. We had one mechanical failure, but that happens to everybody. But, uh, but, yeah. but Vincent, it looks like you have a really short keel and it looks like you've got a rudder sticking out at a funny angle there. You, you mentioned that this is a lifting keel and you have twin rudders. That's kind of a unique uh, you know, feature of, of a cruising boat. Um, on the lifting keel, uh, you know, do you lift it when you're cruising and gunk holing or is it lifting because it, for this purpose of storage? Um, and does that cause any, you know, issues on board, like, you know, knocking or water, you know, entry, you know, what, what's the story behind the lifting keel? Yeah, um, the, the, so the, the, this is kind of typical of these French, French build exploration boats. And there's a number of different models with these, with different variants of lifting keels and center boards. This one has a vertical fin. Um, and as you pointed out, uh, in this case, the keel is up. So the draft at this point is, is uh, five feet and then we can drop the keel down to a 10 foot draft. It's pinned, uh, there's a big electric winch with the six to one purchase that lifts the keel, it's very quiet, it goes pretty fast. Um, and then it's, it, it, it is in a waterproof um, keel well um, it has gliders, gliders on the side, so the, there's no noise really. I mean, it, it, it's really it's quiet, and especially once the boat is heeled over, the keel jams itself, and and um, um, it's and that whole bird. keel is inside of a, a casing, so that so it's all contained water that might be you know coming into the you know, touching the keels within this in, the, in a case that's all self-contained. Yes, yes, and the, and the casing goes all the way up to the deck. So there's a port at the deck that we can open and, and actually where we can see the keel come up and down and, and we see the, 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 the ocean uh, at yeah. the sides, yeah. Now, I've, I've personally sailed a, a 46 foot cruising boat with twin rudders and it's amazing the amount of control you have and how the boat will like to heel over and then, you know, kind of stop on its, on its chine there. Uh, how do you, how do you uh, feel about, you know, maybe you could describe driving the boat with, with the twin rudders. How, how do you like that? Yeah, the boat, the boat is, is really easy to control. I mean, we tell you the truth, we rarely steer it. We, we, we end up using the autopilot a lot. Um, and obviously the advantage of the twin rudders is once you heeled over the, the, the lured rudder, uh, does most of the work and, and does it quite well. Um, and the only issue with it for us is that in places where there's ice, the, the, the rudders are vulnerable. And we actually end up touching a piece of ice uh, up in the Northwest Passage and there's a bit of a dent in one of the rudders, but um, nothing, nothing major. Um, okay. Otherwise, and, and, it's, it's very good. Okay. And I think properly we would, we would call this a cutter rig. You've got your, your forward stay and your, your inner stay there. And in this picture, the, the, uh, you know, the stay sail, uh, uh, you know, removable stay sail uh, stay is there as well. So uh, would you call this a cutter rig? Is that how you think of it? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, a type of rig that I sailed with a lot when I was younger and I, I've, I've always really liked it. Easy, easy to handle, safe. Uh, yep. We're going, to, we're going to get more into your sails in a little bit, but the only, only other feature that kind of stands out to me about your boat is it's, you know, it's not the, the tallest mast I've ever seen. So it really must speak to the, you know, to, uh, to, to the boat's ability, you know, to perform with that, that sail area you have there. So I really like this picture of your boat because it just kind of gives you an overall uh, sense of the, of, you know, the rig size and, and the stays and, and how it all comes together. So um, beautiful boat, Vincent, and I can see why you bought it. And I know you put a, a ton of miles on this thing. So um, that's, that's a great starting point to, to learn a little bit about uh, Alioth. Um, and oh, one last question, the Alioth, that's a, a, a navigational star, the name, is, is that the, the story behind yeah, the name? Uh, yeah, that's the original name of the boat and we kept it. Alioth works in, in, in English and in French. Um, and uh, it's the brightest star in the Big Dipper. Got it. So, uh, thought it was appropriate okay. to keep it. 
Okay, next, when we all look up at the Big Dipper tonight, we'll, uh, we'll um, remember the alioth is that bright star up there. So, okay, Vincent, thank you for that. Uh, we're going to move on to um, the Wilkaki, a Spirit 36. This is, this is Waz's boat. Um, so, you know, Waz, you know, same question. Tell us about your boat here. I mean, you, you got to love it because it's yours. You, 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 you researched it, you picked it out. What, were the, what was the, the thought process behind, uh, behind the Wilkaki here? We well, had yeah, a few years ago when we started talking about this whole, my wife and I started talking about going cruising. Um, we have two very different mentalities about what makes a good boat. I mean, we're both, we both would love a catamaran, but it's not practical financially for that. But her sort of mentality, she come, her dad's a cruiser as well. Um, and she has a slightly more sort of Hallberg Rassi, long keel, safe, heavy thinking. I had a slightly more open 1250 racer boy, big wide transom, open cockpit, going fast type mentality. And this, this boat sort of meets somewhere in the middle of that. And we had a, when we, we're looking for boats. We saw a bunch of boats and this was on the list of boats. And every time we looked at a boat, we online, we sort of always kept coming back to this one because it ticked all our boxes. We discussed a little bit like Vince, you know, we discussed what we wanted in a boat. Um, needed to have three cabins because our son's with us. So he needs to have his own room. And then if we've got guests coming, friends or family, they've got, they've got a cabin. He's not always getting kicked out. It needed to be safe um it wanted, we wanted it to sail well um even though we spend 85 90 percent of our time on on anchor when you do go sailing you want it to sail well and enjoy the sailing and um the cutter rig again out the picture there doesn't have the stasel because um our boat had the stasel added to it in build that was never an original specification of these boats um the cutter rig was important to us because it gives you so many options for sailing, um, heavy weather sailing, reaching downwind. It's, it's a safety thing, but also it's just, it makes the sailing better. Um, and so that, that's that interstate that we're seeing in this photo here, that was original to the boat, but not original to the design or is correct. that something you, you added on? No, that was, we, we bought the boat from the original owner. The boat was built in 91 and it's only had one owner before us. Um, and he asked, cause his, we're actually doing what he had always dreamt of doing with the boat, okay. um, which is kind of nice. But he, he had the stasel added to it for that reason, so that he had a cutter rig, had the stasel to go cruising, to give him options, especially heavy weather options. Um, and that's, and, that's a proper uh, you know, structural furler there. There's an extrusion and a wire. Correct. And that, yeah. that doesn't come up or down. No, no, that's a proper, there's a, tang, there's a specific tang in the mast for it, the um, stay is laminated into the bulkhead up forward properly with tie rods and bolts and stuff. So it's good. And Got it. So it just, we, we spoke a lot about the type of boat we wanted and this one just kind of kept, we kept well, they, they, they built, they built a lot of, a lot of, you know, cruising boats in the you know, late eighties and early nineties was, and I think yeah. this is a fine example of, you know, boats that we see a lot in North America as well. You know, um, uh, but this is, I, I like this picture here because it kind of just shows the keel and, and rudder configuration, you know, pretty, pretty standard, standard look there. And then, you know, you mentioned safety and I liked this picture because it really shows what you guys have done to, to, um, you know, to kind of add some safety for your, um, for, for your, your young uh, son out, uh, out there. Yeah. And we've got, we've got jack stays along that are permanently along the deck. So if we're ever sailing, um, there, we always use them and um, the netting there is obviously for the young fella um, and also it's, it kind of just makes it into a cruising boat if you've got netting I think. Yep, um, yep, good. Okay, so that, um, you know, we, we've talked about, you know, each of you, we've, we, we've talked about your, um, your boats. Um, so I thought the, the next um, uh, place I'd like to go is, is to talk a little bit about your, your cruise here. Um, just to you know, to to maybe mention to our to our, our group on the call, to build this this uh, slide deck today, I was uh, given the you know the photo galleries from from Vincent and and Waz's you know kind of personal photo galleries, and it 
it really struck me in both of your galleries how important the people you sail with are. And in your case, was it your family? And um, Vincent, in your case, you said you've had you know a hundred people you know on your boat and in all these different passage uh, passages that you've done. And that might be one interesting you know kind of um, uh, dichotomy here in your in your cruising styles is that you know Waz is living the the full on live aboard experience and you know Vincent you're sort of taking this systematic approach to you know passage making you know finding an adventure planning for it and kind of executing it with you know with the right people and the right preparation but but uh, tell me about this this gang here these these, these good looking guys. Yeah, so uh, obviously me, it, it's me on the right. It's my brother Olivier on the in the middle, and our friend Jean. And this is the three of us um, finishing the Northwest Passage. We crossed the Bering Strait, and the, 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 the crossing of the Bering Strait is the official end to the, the, the Northwest Passage when you do it uh, east to west. Um, and we just had a big blow for, for 36 hours before that, so we kind of relieved to get there too. Uh, and these, uh, you, obviously, your your brother and um, Oliver and um, and is John. Sorry, the third is John, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you guys all grew up sailing together. Is that is that the story? Um, my brother and I uh, have done a lot of cruising together, charter yeah. boats. Uh, you know, in Europe, in Caribbean, uh, we were together down in South America, and we've done uh, we've done Maine together and all that. And we used to charter once a year to at least together. Um, and then John is an old family friend that we kind of reconnected with after we, we purchased Alioff. So we did some sailing with him. Uh, we did a couple of cruises with him and, and crossings with him before, uh, uh, b before him joining us in the, in the, in the passage. And well, we wanted, for the Northwest Passage itself, we, we wanted a short, uh, a small crew. There's three cabins on the boat and we wanted each person to have their own stateroom. We'll, we'll look at it, some of the pictures. You know, I can tell you guys are all great sailors, but but I also found a, a couple of pictures, uh, Vincent, that you know made me kind of question your your choice of, of crew members here. I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure that these guys are as great as as you make them out to be. They look they look like they might be you know a little goofy and have a little trouble right. in, in the galley there. I'm, yeah, you know, the, this is your the, crew, not mine. <laughs> yeah, the galley accident, that's a pretty standard thing on boats. So, you yeah, that, know, that's that happens on a regular basis. But thank God the floor is easy to clean. Yeah, um, but, but, but these two look like they just like to lay around and they're not even steering, steering your boat for you. And then, and then it looks like you got to feed them pretty well too, too Vincent. So um, uh, I, I, I am just goofing around right now because at the end of the day, what was very clear to me about all of your photos is how important you know the people you sail with is, and you have a beautiful uh, your friends and family on that boat, and every trip was different. So um, you know that's who you sail with, and that it looks great, you know, from my perspective. Yeah, it's a pleasure. And we, we, we work hard at trying to stay with people that are compatible and all that, you know. And who who, really who do we see in this, in this photo? Who do we see in this photo here, Vincent? So this is my brother, Olivier, and um, his wife is, is sitting down and his daughter is sitting in the back and a friend of his daughter is, um, is standing there. And I'm, and I'm, I'm uh, trying to uh, figure out how to work out the, the GoPro. Uh, okay, got it. All right, well, let's take a look at the... Um, Oh, I'm going. I'm going the wrong way, guys. I apologize. Uh, that's the Alioth crew. Um, let's take a look at the Wakaki crew. Uh, Waza, you told us a little bit about your wife growing up um, uh, sailing. So here, here's the three of you. Uh, tell us about you know how the how the three of you guys get along on the boat. Yeah, the, it's amazing because we, my my wife grew up cruising and has spent probably at least half her life on boats of various forms, um, and we. It's it's kind of like living in an apartment. Um, for Killian, our son, it's his safe place. It's his happy place when he's tired or he's hurt himself or something's not right. He just wants to go back to the boat. Um, and it's it's very much our our home. And we have people on board. It's um, for dinner or lunch or whatever. And friends come and stay with us. Uh, and it's 
it's an interesting dynamic. We've, my wife and I are probably closer together now than we were before we left because we've been through a few experiences and we've learned, we could obviously both say our before and trusted each other in, in the sailing sense, but we've learned so much more about the depth of our personalities and things sailing offshore with each other. And, and Killian's been great. It's, he's such a little trooper. He loves love sailing he's looking forward to going sailing now we've been telling him that we're leaving to go to Grenada in the next week or so and he's he's ready to undo the lines and head off um and, and Vincent Vincent uh, uh Waz's crew actually steers the boat that might be um something you could you could, a picture you could show your your crew there um so nice to see his crew's actually steering I think we probably haven't done enough miles to actually not want to steer <laughs> I think enough miles yeah. he's done enough steering now and this is this is the picture that that broke the internet about as about as as cute as it gets. But um, I did have a question about this guy. I saw him as as in one of your photos. Is this uh, is this a crew member or is this is this dinner? Yeah, Who was this guy? That was a crew member who misbehaved. He ended up in a bucket for dinner. So yeah. um, the he's that crew. He got um he was spotted by we were paddle boarding one day and his little antlers got spotted while we were somewhere and um it was suggested by by the young fellow that I went and caught him. So that was, uh, I had to go back and grab him. In the okay. afternoon, so. so the Wakaki crew uh, became dinner. I, I got it. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's keep moving here, guys. Um, the, uh, the next area, you know, part of the, the, you know, the, the slide deck is, we'd just like to talk a little bit about your sales. Um, I know that each of you spent a lot of time, you know, working with North sales, thinking about your sales, what, you know, walking through all of the, you know, the options um, and the features and the specifications of your sales. Um, and I know that you're, you're both, you know, kind of relatively you know, satisfied with what you guys have on board today. But I also learned from both of you that, you know, your sale inventory is sort of an evolving process. And I know that for you, Vincent, you've uh, made a, a couple of changes along the way. And, and Waz, I know from you that, you know, there may be one or two sales you'd, you'd still like to add uh, to, to the inventory. Uh, but Vincent, um, I think this is your, ba your basic sale inventory here is, the, is, a, is a cross cut, you know, Dacron full batten mainsail. Uh, you have a, a, a radian, a radial, uh, Dacron, uh, Genoa, maybe maybe some would call it a Yankee. Mm -hmm. um, you, you then have a, a 3DI inner jib, a, a molded composite inner jib. And then the fourth sale that's really the, you know, the, the top four sales of your inventory is that, is that you know, stay sale, that uh, hank on stay sale on the, on the third stay back. I know you carry a storm jib and you've got a, a couple of a downwind sales. Is that the, the basic inventory there, Vincent? Yeah, yeah, and and and, um, and we ended up uh, as soon as we got the boat, we replaced the mainsail and the Genoa. Um, you know, the sails that the boat had done fifty thousand miles uh, with the previous owners, so it was time to replace the sails. And we've been we've we've been very happy. I mean, we it, it was kind of a, a amazing process because the sail got measured in Belgium by a French designer uh, from North. Um, I think I, I think it might have been Pur in Nevada who designed the sail and then it got produced in Connecticut and shipped to Norway and we got the sails there and we didn't within an hour they were on the boat and they fitted and it was really good. It's been a very satisfying process. Um, well, well the, the, this photo here of your mainsail, um, you know, it, again, it's it's a Dacron crosscut mainsail, full battens with batten boxes and luff slides. But I think this photo here shows shows the, the fourth reef, which I know that you added after, um, or less I should say before going uh, on the Northwest Passage. So this, this sail has, has four reefs in it here, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So we, we, we um, originally the sail was built with three reef. Um, after sailing the boat for probably 25,000 miles and, and prior to the passage, we decided it was time to kind of add another reef to it. Um, and um, and we luckily we, we had it because we ended up using it, um, and it, you know it, it didn't really change the and any effect on the sale, and and um, it was a little complicated trying to figure out all the reef lines, but eventually we managed to figure out all the reef lines so we can actually fly the sail up uh, all the way 
with all the reefs rigged um, and everything can be worked out from the cockpit. So it, it, it's, it's actually really nice and safe to have. Excellent. And this photo, this main is, at, is um, somewhere on the Northwest Passage, I believe. Um, I don't, I don't remember, um, but, but likely we, yeah. we, we motored a lot during the, in Northwest Passage, it's mostly about motoring. So we, we, there was a lot of time we were looking at this, yeah. Well, the sail still looks great in this photo. And what I find interesting, uh, Vincent, is that, you know, it made sense to buy a, a cross-cut mainsail for you. The, the, a cross-cut sail is maybe at its, at its best on a tall, thin, high aspect sail like the main. Um, but you know the the the, the cross-cut panels are being helped out by you know the structure of the of the full battens and also a lot of the structure of the reefs. What I see in this picture is is you know your clue patch, your first reef, uh, your second reef, and your third reef in there. But it's all tied together by what almost is a is an entire leech ply. You know, so that's how we we build the sails at North Sails. So. It's a Dacron crosscut main, but it has a, a lot of additional structure, kind of helping helping that sail uh, maintain its its shape over its lifespan. But on on your head sail, you chose a, a, a tri radial sail, and that was uh, really for for shape holding purposes. So this is your, I think it's a 110. You know, um, not the highest clue sail around, but this is your go to uh, roller furling. Genoa, maybe you'd call it a Yankee, but this this is the the, the, the all-purpose head sail on the boat. Yeah, and, and one of the things that worked out really well on this sail is, is that there's some padding. Um, North, North put some padding along the luff uh, to, to take up some of the shape when we furl it. And, and, and that actually, to, to my surprise, has worked out really well. So we we actually able to, to use this sail partially rolled up and still have a very decent shape. Okay, we call that a, a rope luff. Um, sometimes it's built as a foam luff, but a you know a nicely executed rope luff will give you you know a, a few turns on that on that head stay and and, and provide some from decent sail shape. Uh, you know, coming back from the the, the Genoa, this is an iceberg, <laughs> but I like this picture um, because it really showed the, kind of the the profile of your your inner jib. And in this case, um, we built you a 3DI Nordac uh, molded composite cruising sail. And I think it's maybe because you learned that this sail was important. And also, we, we had a little test we wanted to run with you and, and see how this sail was going to perform. So this, this is your inner jib. And um, uh, it gets used in a variety of ways, right? Yeah, yeah, and I, I, that sail has is, is actually been really good for us. Um, we got it right before the Northwest Passage. It's, it's very, very easy to roll and unroll, um, and it keeps its shape very well. Um, and it, it's, it, you're probably going to talk about it. It's enabled us to go to a triple rig, a, a triple head rig in the front. Um, one, one, one thing that, um, um, as you can see in this picture, this is an old picture of the boat prior to us owning it. That's the stay sail, that the hang, the hang on stay sail. Um, and and, and at, at that stage, the boat only had one roller filling jib in the front. Uh, it had, like, like Waza's boat, had the chain plate on the mast and on the deck for uh, the inner jib, but they were hoisting it on a two to one halyard um, and they could never get the loft tension on it. So pretty, uh, as soon as we got the boat, we added the other roll of furling and, and uh, um, that, that's, here's the, the example of the, the triple head rig. With that, we basically can go from, you know, 10 knots of wind to 50 knots of wind without any having, ever having to go forward uh, of, of the cockpit. So while this is a, a kind of a, maybe a, a very, old traditional way of sailing with multiple head sails. It's also Waza, I think we'll say it's kind of becoming a modern way too. A lot of a lot of offshore race boats are learning to put their storm jib up and triple head reach and it becomes a really versatile and powerful uh, weapon and, and great way to balance the boat in, in different conditions. Yeah and we were we were until we got the uh, the laminated chip, we were not able to do this. The, the, the old Dacron chip was just too full to, to enable us to do it. And, and the truth is that while cruising, we rarely hard on the wind. So this work, as soon as we start cracking sheets, we, we can pretty rapidly go, go to this rig here. 
So that was one question I had for you, uh, Vincent, is, you know, looking at this, this stay sale configuration, I, in my experience, you know, you know, stay sales and double head or triple head wor rigs work well once you're powered up. But, but what about uh, underpowered light air close reaching? I'm, I'm surprised we haven't talked about a, you know, kind of code zero type sale for your boat. Have, have, you, have you thought about the need for kind of a, a free flying light air close reacher? Yeah, I, I actually, the, that, that's the next sale on the list for us would be to try to get a, a code zero because, of, you know, the boat, the boat as it is, is like a 10 to 12 knot boat. And that's the minimum amount of wind for us to be able to, to sail properly for, for the Northwest Passage because it was so loaded with food and spares and gear and all that. It was probably a 15 knot boat. Um, but in reality, I, with a code zero, we could probably bring it down to to being a like a seven to eight knot boat, which would be quite nice. I, I think you will. So we'll uh, we'll keep that on the list. So um, well, thank you, Vincent. So Wakaki sail inventory a little leaner. You got the the full bat and main, kind of a traditional uh, all purpose roller furling Genoa Waza. You've got um, all 3DI Nordac uh, molded composite sails. You got an inner jib, and you said you have a storm jib somewhere in the the V-birth that you, you really don't uh, think about much and a symmetric spinnaker. Uh, but here's a shot of your mainsail. Um, you're carrying three reefs on this sail, is that right, Waza? Yeah, three reefs. We, I spent a fair bit of time having the, the advantage of working for Norse at the time. The sail designer is a, a good, good friend of mine and we spent quite a lot of time working on um, the, the reef sizing specifically um, to make life easy. So our first our first reef is kind of a flat, it's, I can't remember the percentage, but it's a flattening reef that makes life very easy. So you put it in and then you just take the edge off the boat when, you, when you're sailing. And the second reef is um, sort of down to about the head of the main, so it comes down to the staysail. So in theory, we're sailing, if we're sailing up, when we're staysail the mainsail together in breeze. And then the third reef is what would be a rated trisal area under ORC, IRC rating. Um, okay, well, one thing I noticed about Waz's pictures is he takes most of his, his sail pictures from down below looking up at the, at the sail shape. And I think um, anybody would be impressed with, with that type of sail shape on a, on a cruising sail. Um, you know, moving forward into your Genoa, you know, again, kind of an all-purpose roller furler Genoa here was, but but not the highest clue I've ever seen. That's uh, on the low side for, for a cruising sail. Yeah, I'm, that's probably a little bit of my racer boy coming out in me. It was, again, a little bit like Vincent thinking where it's easy to reduce sail. The problem is when you're in six, eight knots of breeze, if you, we want to be able to sail and we do a lot of sailing. Um, we've only spent about 250 euros on diesel since august last year um we do a lot of sailing and we also do a fair bit of sailing in lightish airs you know if the if the day's eight and it might start out at six or eight knots of breeze you want to be able to sail in that you want to be able to sail the boat properly um and then you can reduce sail as as you go along and same as vincent we've got the rope the luff flattener the rope flattener on the on the front end of the Genoa there for reefing and we've sailed upwind with one or two reefs in that thing and it's it's bang on it's just it takes a shape out of the middle of the sail and makes makes that sailing uprange a little bit more comfortable because you're not fighting the boat and then we then we step into the stays so once we get to about 18 or 20 knots of breeze we're into the stays so. so another shot of your Genoa you know sort of trimmed out and it's impressive to see the, you know, the, the nice smooth sail shape here. Um, and then that's the same Genoa looking from, from down below. So again, a, a glass smooth sail, um, you know, made in the, in the 3DI uh, Nordak uh, fashion. Um, yeah. Guys, just, just, just a little reality check. We're about 40 minutes in. We can go another 30 minutes or so. Um, so if I go a little faster than I practice, it's just because I, there's so many uh, more slides. I just want to make sure, sure we get to. Um, but uh, sorry, Wallace, I cut you off there. But here, here's, your, here's your, um, your inner jib as well. Yeah. Um, and we, we mess about with it. I, you know, I tend to be, when we go cruising, I, 
I get a bit itchy when we're sailing and my wife's come up on deck once. Um, I had, I was cross sheeting and sheeting after and had flatteners on things and outboard leads and everything going on. And she just shook her head. She's like, we're cruising. I was like, yeah, yeah, but. Yeah, but. Well, you're every, everyone's always trying to get more and better performance um, out of their boats. So we're, we're going to move forward here, guys. And um, this subject of mainsail reefing, and we don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but you each had a lot of photos on of your boats with, with mainsail reefs in. And it's a, it's a subject that we talk a lot about with our customers um, and in terms of, you know, the number of reefs and the system of reefing. You both have slab reefing with full batten mains and slides. So these aren't, you know, mass furling or boom furling sails. But I thought that these two pictures of Vincent were really nice examples of, you know, what we look for as a sail maker with a, a nice flat foot, you know, on your first reef. And on the second reef, again, a, a really nice flat uh, sail shape. You'll notice that, the, that in both cases, there's a batten right above your, your reefing point. Um, but this, feature here I think is really important Vincent and maybe you can just talk a little bit about how you guys reef the sail but you'll notice that that tack uh, reef line is really pulling the sail forward and making sure there's no point loading on that batten box up up above you've got a nice uh, positioning of your reef lines here keeping the, the mainsail um, foot nice and flat I think that's what we're kind of the first thing we're looking for on on mainsail reefing uh, would you agree Vincent yeah, yeah, and, and we have a we have a, a separate uh, inboard end and outboard end reefing line, so it makes it easier for us to to adjust. Um, in this case, this is the the time where we use the forts reef uh, uh, in the storm before uh, reaching the the bearing straight, and and it was first first time we we're using the forts reef, and unfortunately the the, the lead was the lead on the outboard end was set up a little bit too far aft, uh, but uh, there was no way we were going to get the sail back up to. Uh, to correct that so uh, you, you bring this leg uh, forward yeah, a little bit yeah i would have liked it to f pull for further you know eventually i moved the move the, the the lead uh, forward of the main sheet there and that, that worked that works and it looks and it looks like you just run your lines right through the ring no special blocks or anything back there no no just uh, you know even up i mean there's some friction in the system but it works pretty well and and here's waza's uh reef also down to the third reef is that right waza yeah that's the third reef and it's you know, we we spent a bit of time on setting up the reefing properly so that we can reef it again from the cockpit like Vincent, which is from when you're cruising, you don't want to be getting out of the cockpit if you can help it. If it's breezy because you're shorthanded, it's generally you want to be sort of just staying back in the cockpit and being safe. And being able to reef and reef well um, uprange is, is massive. Um, I'm not a for offshore cruising, I'm not a massive fan of anything other than the the two line reefing system because it it works. You can control it, you can adjust it, and it's really simple and it works and worked for a long time. And um, I, I notice you're again. I'm kind of focused on this tack reef line, just like um, uh, Vincent's sail. You really have the the reef point is well far aft of the of the loft and it's pulling forward. Again, you're just running a reef line straight through your block. Nice yep. flat foot, you know, beautiful you know, reef sail shape. Um, I think you told a story about um, uh, about needing to reef downwind when you when you left the med, and you said that was a bit of an eye opener for you, right? Yeah, we sort of, I guess we we left probably with a slight arrogance as far as the sailing side of things went because we both sail, we both know how to sail, and we got we kind of got a bit of a hammering when we left Gibraltar to go down to the Canaries, and we got we got caught out one eight one night. And we we're in 30 plus knots of breeze with big, with four or five meter running sea. And we had to go from dead down when we had to go from second to third reef. And I was a bit nervous about being able to get it in in that much breeze. And it all worked perfectly. We just wound the left down, wound the back down. And that gave us so much confidence in the boat and ourselves because the system worked, which meant that whatever situation we're in we can get the sails down which is when it's windy and you get every i think everybody gets caught out occasionally it's nice to know that it works and it's and we kind of left mallorca in a bit of a well slightly unprepared and we hadn't 
actually done a lot of practicing reefing. I think it's something that people should do is spend some time learning how to reef your boat, learning how the systems work and don't be afraid to use it. You're better off sailing properly and being able to use the systems than always motoring or not, you know, not having enough sail up, which can be as much of a problem as too much sail. I, I normally think of, you know, reefing upwind or reefing on a close reach, but having to go from a second to a third reef while dead down wind and 35 knots at night, that, that sounds challenging. Yeah. Um, so it was actually, nice to hear. On our boat, it ended up being a lot easier than I thought it would be. I thought it was going to be a disaster, but it all went pretty smoothly. Great. Another, moving on here, guys, another topic we, you know, kind of hear a little bit about, and I think is an interesting topic is, you know, kind of sailing with, with autopilots, you know, and how to trim your sails, you know, with an autopilot. And Vincent, I, I saw a lot of photos in, in your, your gallery, you know, that looked like this, you know, kind of maybe motor sailing with, with no one at the helm. And then I saw a couple that, that looked like this, where you were, you know, autopilot sailing in, in a little bit more wind. And then I saw one where you were autopilot sailing in, in what looks like some serious uh, weather here. And then I found this, this video um, uh, of yours. So I thought it'd be kind of fun just to see a little bit of uh, autopilot sailing in, in what's, you know, looks, uh, what looks to be um, some, uh, some strong conditions here. So let's see if we can get this, this video to work. It looks yeah, so this is, in the, this is in the storm approaching the Bering Strait. Uh, it's kind of the end of the storm. You, know, you can see the, the, the cape there on the top left corner. Um, you know, in the seas where like 10, 12 foot breaking seas and we got up to 42, 45 knots of wind. Um, and, and the boat steers fine and the autopilot. I mean, we, 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 uh, we, we, we spend most of our time sailing under the pilot, unless the conditions are fun and someone will take the helm for a while. Um, we, we let the boat steer itself. Um, and this is actually the start of the celebration of the, the crossing. Um, one thing that we have to do for, for, the, uh, for the, the, the Arctic sailing is that the, the magnetic compasses or flex gate compasses don't work very well up there. So um, we ended up uh, adding a GPS compass to the, to, the, to the boat. It was a, actually a surprisingly inexpensive addition and, and uh, uh, that was our compass for, for, for the whole Northwest Passage. Um, we were lucky because during that storm, there was a French boat that was uh, a little bit smaller than us and they were a few miles away. And they had to hand steer for 36 hours, uh, where they were hand steering the whole way through. They didn't have, uh, they couldn't rely on their compass. And they were really all over the place. And our boat steers like a, like a train on, on tracks. Um, the, 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 the twin rudders definitely help in these conditions. Uh, I'd like to, uh, maybe we can get into this a little bit more um, because I am a couple slides behind. But, you know, the idea of setting your autopilot to true wind angle or apparent wind angle or heading um, or uh, whether you're trimming to, to the autopilot or having the autopilot steer to the sails. Um, I think it's a really interesting topic that um, you know, maybe we can get to at the, at the Q&A session here. Um, and also, Waz, I know that you have bought a um, a self steer as well. Um, and and you know, what percentage of sailing would you say you're on? You're on autopilot uh, on your boat, uh, Waza. Uh, a little bit like Vincent. We we actually do a lot. Most of it's on autopilot. I mean, we we will quite often jump on the wheel and drive it because we both love sailing. We both love driving the boat. Um, but the reality is, you know, when you're on watch at night and stuff, you are you are generally on autopilot. You probably 80% of the time you're on autopilot. It's a, it has to be so that you can go, on, you know, you've got other things you need to do to make sure the boat's safe and on course, whether it's navigating, especially shorthanded. We've, there's only two of us sailing. So if you need to go down and check chart or radar or whatever it is, then you need to leave the boat on autopilot. And, um, I think you know if it's a good sail, if the boat's a good sailing boat, and you trim your sails correctly, then you can the boat should be reasonably balanced, and it shouldn't be too much harder for the autopilot to steer the boat than it is for a person. Yeah, probably the only difference 
really is maybe a bit of anticipation, but at night time, you can't, unless you've got a perfectly clear night with a great moon, you're not going to be able to see the waves or the wind anyway. So you're reacting to things half the time you're sailing anyway at night time. So you need to trim your boat, you know, whether it's reefing or actual sail trim to, to make it easy enough for the autopilot. And it's the same as when you're hand steering. Yeah, in our case, in our case, I mean, the only time we were obviously sailing by hand, by by hand steering was the time we were in in ice and going around ice pieces. But the rest of the time is is really most of the time is uh, autopilot, and then um, it's typically set to a heading unless we're sailing downwind, and then we use true wind angle as the setting. Um, and that seemed to work pretty well. Well, that's a, that's a great segue because we do have a, a little a bit of downwind sailing. Uh, to talk about. Uh, this is your symmetric spinnaker, uh, Vincent, and I know you get this. Oh, up. oh I'm sorry, this is Waza. Um, there's there's Alios uh, symmetric spinnaker. So both of you guys will use a symmetric spinnaker, you know, with a pole, kind of traditional setup when when, when conditions allow. Um, I also uh, have, you know, photos of, of both of your boats in, you know, kind of pulled out wing on wing configuration. Vincent, you know, that 110 high clued sail looks like it just fits perfectly in a wing on wing configuration here. This is a, a common common downwind mode for you guys. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, 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 you know, it, especially with the, the kind of smaller genera being on the smaller side, you can actually carry it quite high, which is which is nice. Um, and at night, it's a pretty safe configuration to, to carry it. And, and was in your case, it looks like you might furl your, your 140 up a little bit when you put it out on the pole. Is that correct? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit condition, wind, wind strength and wave um, condition, sea state dependent, because if it's, if it's lighter, then we'll, un, we'll unfurl most of it. But the Atlantic, for example, when we were there, it's pulled out there and all the way out. Um, across the Atlantic, when we had some pretty average weather, we were probably two and a half reefs in it pulled out and you could just strap the thing down and lock it off and trundle along quite happily um so there then, you are there you are pulled out with the full genoa and there you are pulled out with kind of a a few a few reefs on it making it a little bit flatter and a little bit more stable correct yeah this i think that pictures of us coming into antigua um so we were better conditions and just pushing it a bit harder um and this video also is kind of um, earlier on. This one's actually earlier on in the Atlantic crossing when we were still a bit gun ho and, you know, decided that we were going to set records across the Atlantic. But, um, yeah, for the Genoa's reefed in a sort of two and a half reefs there. We're probably in about 20 knots of breeze. Um, got the staysail out to try and help dampen the rolling a little bit. Um, and, again, the staysail, we just sort of, played around with it. Um, reefing, you can see the staysail's reefed as well, which was just to make life, just so it wasn't flapping around and slapping so much. But again, when it gets a bit lighter and the sea state's a bit better, more sail area. And the joke on our boat is that it's seven knots. Everywhere we go, it's uh, we do seven knots. Um, we average seven knots across the Atlantic. And when our passage planning is generally based on six knots, but inevitably we sail everywhere at seven knots. But well, Waza, this this twin, you know, kind of head sail, wing on, you know, double head sail, downwind rig, is a popular, you know, kind of trade wind setup, and um, you know, we see different boats, you know, accomplish this in different ways, and um, we even sell specialty sails that are kind of free flying versions of a of a twin head sail, and I know that you're contemplating the, the trade wind sail for when you go through the, the canal and start heading towards the South Pacific. That's, you know, that's the mode a lot of people like to use uh, offshore trade wind sailing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's, um, the trade wind would be a nice addition, but that, that whole setup with the pulled out general is, is amazing because if it gets a bit breezy or a squall comes, you just furl the thing away, get through your squall or whatever the situation is, and then you, unfurl it again and off you go and we generally would set ourselves up at night probably putting a second reef in at night just to 
because we had a lot we had a lot of school action coming across the Atlantic so we would second reef and then have a we would play with the general on the pole as we went along just don't be again don't be afraid of using the the gears that you have on the gear on you have on the boat excellent um yeah that that's one of the advantages i've, I've heard of using that trade wind configuration is you can you can control your power uh, quite easily so thank you to everybody who's who's um you know hung in there this long we we you know, really covered kind of the technical slides we wanted to talk about and now i have some you know really beautiful photos from um each of our guests adventures um not too much longer so i think we'll be able to you know wrap this up with within about another uh six to, to ten minutes but um this is a great view of what vincent's uh, team has done they they started out in belgium they went north to norway looks like they took a right turn around iceland across the atlantic and Vincent, I think this is where you're supposed to go through the Panama Canal and keep going to Tahiti, but uh, you decided to come up and visit us here in Newport. And then God almighty, you took this blue line and went over North America and ended up in, in Alaska. I mean, you did the Northwest Passage. Isn't that like something that explorers have been dreaming of for hundreds, if not thousands of years? Yeah, yeah, and it's obviously been a dream for a while. I mean, the, 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 you know, the, the, the long-term goal with the boat, and hopefully we'll get there, is, is to, to actually do the tour of the Americas, we call it, you know, doing the Northwest Passage and then go down all the way to Antarctica and back to Europe. Um, we'll see what happens next few years here, whether we will manage to do it. But um, yeah, and, 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 and the Northwest Passage, um, it's obviously still challenging, but it's getting easier to do nowadays with, the, you know, unfortunately with the, the global warming. Um, so this is, uh, this is the early stage. Where is this? Is, is this Newport or in Maine? That's, I, I believe that's Castle Hill in Newport. That's Castle Hill, a, yeah, okay, okay. We've got a lot of lighthouses. Um, I'll go through some of your photos, Vincent, but I'll just let everybody know that uh, maybe after the, um, seminar will we'll send out a link to your personal website because it's really informative and you have so much more beautiful photography on there but i thought these pictures and you can speak to them as i kind of click through them really really talk about how amazing you know cruising experiences can be yeah so we we we, we started from newport in uh early may of last year sailed um, to uh, Maine and then Halifax, Nova Scotia. We left the boat there for a couple of years, a couple of months, and then really starting the, uh, the, the, the Northwest Passage trip uh, early June. We went through the Bedore Lakes. This is St. Peter's Canal, uh, Bedore Lakes at the uh, eastern end of, uh, of Nova Scotia. Um, kind of the, the lakes open. We, we, you're going through, through them fast. Yeah, sorry, I, I hit it too fast there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, from there, we went to St. Pierre and Miquelon, and then the south coast of, uh, of uh, Newfoundland. Uh, beautiful, rugged south coast. Uh, a gorgeous place. I'd love to go back there. Um, and then we sailed between Newfoundland and uh, Labrador. Uh, stopped in Gourmand uh, National Park um, along the, the coast of, uh, uh, of Newfoundland. And then uh, north of that is what uh, it was called the Strait of Belle Isle, where we saw the first uh, ice. I think that's the next slide here. Um, yeah, th that was our first uh, first iceberg. So, so there's a circulation in in the in in, in the ocean uh, between Greenland and Labrador, uh, and the circulation is kind of clockwise. And all of these icebergs that come down along the coast of Newfoundland come from. Uh, and uh, mostly from Disco Bay, which is halfway up the west coast of Greenland. Um, and they're slowly melting. Um, one of those is the, is the one that, uh, that uh, got, got hit by the Titanic uh, a long time ago. <laughs> but yeah. you, you, you also visit the, the, the west coast of Greenland there. Yeah. Where, where is this yeah. photo? Um, you, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not exactly sure where, which point where, but that's pretty typical of the scenery on the west coast of Greenland. Um, uh, and this is in this, uh, oh, I know where that photo is. That, that photo is, an, is Disco Island. 
that's approaching Disco Island, which sits in the mis middle of Disco Bay. Disco Bay is um, the place where the most uh, productive glacier uh, in the world is located. And, um, and, and the bay, although it's not shown on, on this picture, is, is totally loaded with, with icebergs, gigantic ones. Uh, and we have to get, a, obviously, a piece of 10,000 year ice for, for the for glass of scotch, you know. So the, the, nice. crew, was, the crew was in need there. Um, nice. So and, and this is a, a mooring on Disco Island uh, before, before crossing over towards Baffin Island. Uh, yeah, we, I was lucky that uh, the two other guys were really good cooks on the boat, so we ate very well. Um, uh, on, making on, me hungry on, with this. With yeah, this I don't have the patience of the gift. This, this is Baffin Island, you know, we're in northern, uh, northern part of Canada. Um, and um, that's pretty typical scenery of the Northwest Passage. It's, it's, um, it's not really rocky, it's more scree, and then um, and glaciers on top uh, coming down to, to, to the ocean. Um, those those glaciers look like they're they're going the wrong direction, uh, sadly to my eye. Yes, yes, yeah, and a number of them are, you know. Um, so all the ice we're seeing, um, and this is the the start of the Northwest Passage. This is the entrance between Baffin Island and, in our case, Billard Island, um, and that's the official start of the Northwest Passage. Um, and we were there early August. Uh, this is an amazing story. This guy, Randall Reeves. Um, is worth uh, following. He um, had just solo circ circumnavigated um, Antarctica from San Francisco and then gone up, gone up the Atlantic, and he was doing the Northwest Passage solo. So we kind of we spent a fair amount of time sailing, sailing together. Uh, lovely guy, great story, unbelievable. And he, uh, he, his goal was to do it within a year, and he ended up in San Francisco a week too early, so he had to wait outside of San Francisco Bay for a week to, to make sure he entered at the right time. You know? yeah. and and what's the name we, of his boat? What's the name of his boat, Vincent? Molly, Molly, M-O-L-I. I think we have a photo maybe of his boat. Yeah, yeah, this is, um, this is one of the hikes that we took uh, um, always, always on the lookout for bears, and, and we unfortunately we only saw one polar bear. Uh, this is going down. And this, here's Randall and Molly. Uh, we're going down the the um, the ice now has shifted from uh, the the early ice is iceberg, it's freshwater ice from glacier. This is all ice pack ice, so it's saltwater ice, uh, and it gets a lot denser and and all that. And we just went through the densest patch together. And um, and my brother cooked him a, a, a bread, and we tossed him the bread, and he had not had fresh bread for quite a while, so he was quite happy to eat it on deck there. So, so that's a loaf of bread that you made on Alioth and, and handed off to Molly. Yeah, yeah, we just tossed it over like a like a football. Very very nice. Yeah. Well, yeah. if if I can just say that your the photography on your website is incredible, and you see a lot of photos like this and even more of that Northwest Passage. Um, so we would like to direct people uh, to your website. Um, we're gonna look at a couple of um, Waza's um, uh, photos from his Atlantic crossing in, in the Caribbean. And Waza, you can just uh, maybe comment as you please here. Yeah, so um, this is up in a place called Pinel, which is a little island just north of St. Martin. Um, you, that's St. Martin in the background. Then we had some friends staying with us, that's their daughter with Killian, the kids are just swimming and we just anchored the boat and um, paddled ashore and there's a bar and restaurant there. This is the very first fish we caught. This was actually coming out of um, the Med and I think it might possibly hold the record for the world's smallest tuna, but um, <laughs> the young fella, he's so, so keen on his fish. He's, um, every time we catch a fish, he's got the knife out ready. To, ready hey, Papa, you're gonna need this. So he's, he'll be sleeping and come up to catch a fish with us. Um, this, I think, was, oh, that was our, that tender actually, my wife's father built that in 1975 um, when he was cruising around the world on, on Wanderer 3. Uh, he built that in Maine and kept it and he still had it and he bequeathed it to us. Um, and we've, we've changed tenders now because it's too small for the three of us. Um, but we bought that across from New York, across the Atlantic, and we had it for a long time until, um, 
February this year or something. And then we've put it in a friend's container. It's going back to New York now, but. Um, oh, I'm glad you're going to hang on to it. That's a great story. Yeah. But uh, I think that your photos, this, there's got to be a story here if this made it into your gallery. But yeah, your we, we got Sorry, go ahead. That, that, that previous photo, we got three days out or two days out of Gibraltar. Like, there's a lot of water in the build. What's going on? And we started hunting around and um, I think the boat's quite old and just we started using it now and then the, the shaft seal had dried out and the rubber had gone bad and we were leaking water so we ended up taping that up and we arrived in Grand Canaria cut the tape off motored for five minutes to drop the anchor and taped it back up and then got hauled out the next day um so but so yeah two days out of Gibraltar we were sinking not not too bad it was only a couple of buckets an hour but it was you know a bit unpleasant and then the monkey he loves climbing everything he trees the mast everything well, your, your, your photos are also great, but uh, particularly Waza, this, uh, this really, this little video here to me shows what, you know, sailing and cruising and family and friends is all about. Um, Vincent, I'm sure you have a, a few moments like this on your boat, but what a great way to end our presentation with um, this video here. Yeah, we're, a couple, we're three or four days out of Antigua and all these dolphins appeared one afternoon and just they hung out for 45 minutes and all we had a friend on board that did the the crossing with us so there was four of us on board and we're all up in the bow just the boat sailing along it you know sort of we would go about 15 20 knots of breeze and these dolphins were around for 45 50 minutes and yeah it's just just such a magical moment to have for the for the young fella well, I, I could watch that video all day, and I think we've all probably had similar moments with, with dolphins and, and, and marine life and sea life around the boat. So um, really, I, I, I'm, I'm bummed out that we couldn't spend more time on, on your pictures. Um, we do have galleries. We can, we can kind of send um, uh, everyone that's been on the call with us, but I do want to honor our time commitment. We started at about 4.05, or sorry, 3.05. It's now 4.10, so we're really nearing the end of our of our presentation. Um, I'm happy to stay on and, and field any any uh, additional calls. We can we can uh, or questions. We can take some questions by by email. Um, but again, Waza, you know, to me and Vincent, you know, what I heard and learned from both of you guys is is you know just it's all about the experience and and the people you're sailing with and then having the right equipment, you know, to do it in, in safe. Uh, manner and being, you know, versatile and evolving and adapting as you go. So um, I couldn't think of a better photo here, Waza, and video to to leave it with your family because you, you guys are both, you know, really really inspiring um, uh, us to all to all go cruising. But there there might be one last um, important item that we should that we should talk about uh, b before we uh, move on to a Q and A session, and that's the probably one of the most important cruising items that. That, uh, that I know about personally. So uh, Vincent, your crew again is never fails to impress. I, I love your guys and your team. And I found this, uh, this um, photo maybe a, a particularly fun to, to sort of end our, our presentation on. Yeah, and, and I should mention this photo was taken around 2 a.m. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, know, we know for the Arctic Circle, uh, so that there was no night at that point and uh, he, you know, so this isn't yeah. drinking in the day, this is drinking at night. It is at night, yes, yes. Okay. okay. Well, well, thank you for that, uh, Vincent, and thank you, Waza. You guys are uh, both um, really great presenters and guests, and um, I can't thank you enough for joining the, you know, the call today. Um, I have a counterpart from No Sales, Zoe, who's been uh, running this call. Zoe, if you want to just jump on and let us know how we did um, and how we uh, how we kind of sign off, we're happy to take a couple questions if you if anybody has some, and if we can't get to them on the call, we can we can certainly respond by by email. Yeah, there's a I just saw on the the chat there. There's um, how does three guy Nordic prefer, perform furled over time? um our our sales are still great we've we've done a lot of upwind miles well i say a lot of upwind miles you know several hundred upwind miles filled with our 3di nordax and that genoa has got five thousand miles on it and we're not as much as i'd like to be careful with stuff we're not 
you know, you get into a, a shorthand and you get into a situation and the thing still looks new. It's, it's pretty impressive. It's actually, so far, it's been pretty impressive with everything. Yeah, and we put about 7,000 miles an hour, so that, you know, it, it looked it still looked impeccable. Yeah. Yeah, ask me again in a year's time when we do this all over again, and I'll probably hopefully have the same answer for you. But it's so far, it's been un, unreal that stuff. It's just holding its shape. It's there's no chafe, there's no stretch. It's just it's I'm being pretty happy with it. Yeah, so three so three D I Nordac is our is our three D I version of, of cruising sails. It's one hundred percent polyester uh, filaments uh, made on the on the thermo formed. Uh, 3DI molds, and really it, it was our kind of our first, you know, high tech, um, you know, polyester, you know, cruising sail. And as it turns out, we have a kind of an entire um, uh, new product line um, based upon our 3DI Nordac experience that we're going to be uh, launching in, in the in the coming days. So anyone on this call that wants to sign up for more information. Um, on, on our uh, some new cruising products that'll be coming forthrightly. It looks like Morgan, you know, Morgan, you know, besides keeping the sails, you know, out of the sun um, and, and keeping them clean, um, they're just like any other sail. They're, you know, there's no, they're not laminates, there's no mylar, um, you know, like any sail, they can get dirty or a little mildew. So just, you just keep them clean, keep them dry. Um, and if they, if they get, you know, chafed or, ripped on, on something or torn like any other sail. You, you just stitch them up, put a patch on it, and, and, and off you go. The other thing about the, you just sort of mentioned mildew there, Bill. I think the, the one thing, both from my experience with our own personal sails, but having worked for North Sails a little, for a little while and dealing with 3DI pretty regularly, is that the mildew is not adhering to the surface of the, of the 3DI like it used to with woven or laminate sails. So there's not anything reinforcement like the the luff ropes and uv maybe get a little bit but the actual surface of the sails pretty much staying clear of of mildew but otherwise yeah normal maintenance same as every sail yep that's that's what we would expect with uh, with the polyester material any other questions from uh from the people remaining on the call Great. Well, we did it, guys. <laughs> I know I was nervous, Waza and Vincent, and you guys were not. So um, uh, thanks again for this. Uh, if you guys want to uh, want to hang on or drop off, it's up to you. But we'll leave the call open for for a couple more moments. But I, th I think we I think we did it. Um, and then Noah's asking about um, sharing the websites. Um, Vincent, it's going to be okay to to share your uh, your your um, Google site with, with the group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Noah, you're going to find the the photography and the and the and and also also it's a great example of a of a really good cruising website. So you know, I know there's a lot of them, but Vincent's done a nice job. So yes, Noah, we'll do that for you. Um, there was one question there about um, how easy are 3D sails to repair while cruising. Super easy. You get a bit of cloth and a bit of 5200, or you can carry the proper. Um, uh, Loctite, high sole Loctite product, but you just give it a clean with some alcohol or some fresh water and stick a bit of stuff on there, and that's good enough to get you through to um, if you need to do a proper repair somewhere else. But they're e probably e the easiest type of sail to repair because you can just stick stuff on them. Adhesive sail repair. Yeah. Yep, yeah. That's that's the way to go. I do have a sewing machine on board, but that's I'm doing more covers <laughs> for that than I am. I'm not doing any sail repairs on it, but it's um yeah for three D. I know you like your sun cover, Plaza. Oh, well, I tell you what, that that's the most important sail on the boat. I reckon is that sun awning. Whoa. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. Donald and Caribbean, you need it. Yeah, and the windsock, my custom built windsock. Actually, I've got two custom built windsocks now, and those things are worth. Worth, well, I was going to say worth the weight in gold, but they don't weigh anything. But they are, phew, that the between the sun awning and the windsocks, those are the most important bits of the boat. 
Uh, yeah, so question from Tom. Yeah, Tom, we, we offer sale repair kits. You can um, just go to our website and look for the, the closest North Sales loft to you and give them a call and they'll, they'll make one up for you. We, we basically make them, you know, to, to, you know, to custom depending upon the kind of sales you have on board and what you might already have. But if you don't have a sale repair kit and you don't have a local sale loft, just uh, shoot me an email and I'll get you in touch with one of our, our service managers. They'll make one up for you. No problem. And uh, from Morgan about the power generation, uh, we've got solar panels. Our engine has a alternator, a 50 amp alternator, which we rarely use. The solar panels, when we're on anchor, that's all we use is we've got through, I think we've got three, I think they're 87 watt panels. Um, I would like to get a wind generator for, because we're at anchor most of the time. Um, I saw Vincent's got the Watton C, which I'm, I've always wanted, but considering how little actual sailing we're doing, it, you know, it's not really necessary for us. We, we, we spend 85% of our, as liverboards, we're spending 80%, 85% of our time anchored. And so solar panels and um, a wind generator would be more than enough in general. I only ever, we only ever run the engine for the water maker um, during the week. And then I think the, we've changed all our nav lights and all our internal lights to LEDs, which has made a, the, the most massive difference. That's, that's probably the biggest power saver. Yeah, in our case, we have the, um, we have a, uh, the one and C hydro generator, which works really well for crossings. Uh, we can get up to 30 amps in there, out of there. It, it, it's really good. It really pulls. Uh, and, and then we have we also have a wind generator that, that stays on most of the time. Uh, we have a small pole, solar panel, but it really doesn't make much difference for us. Yeah, we've got three big solar panels in that. We, those things are amazing. That's great. Hey, uh, hey, Mario, you've asked a question about you know, a mainsail with roller system. Um, you know, we, you know, we, we think of two types of, you know, uh, mainsail furling system, either in mast or, or in boom, you know, in mast furling is a really common approach to cruising boats these days. Many production boats come with, uh, with in mast furling and there's nothing wrong with it at all. It's, it's a great, reliable, safe system. Um, the, I think the only limitation that, that some people would say is you might not be able to get, you know, quite as much um, sail area or quite as uh, same level of shape um, holding um, as you would with a, with a horizontally battened mainsail. But with that said, um, you have a wide range of materials from Dacron crosscut to cruising laminates to 3D eye sails. And um, you also have options on uh, your batten configurations, whether you want some vertical leech battens or full length battens. So if you have a mass furling mainsail, you um, really have a choice of materials and features and specs uh, that are, you know, that, designed around what's going to make sense for you, where you sail and the type of sailing you're doing. So um, yeah, I would again just ask you to reach out to your closest North Sales Loft and we'll get you in touch with a sale expert or shoot me an, an, an email directly. We'll be happy to, happy to talk about that with you. Okay, so guys, we're, we're about 20 minutes over. Um, I think the, the, the questions are, are mostly there. Um, and uh, I think we'll just go ahead and close close the call at this time, if that's okay with everybody. Zoe, if you're um, if you're good to go, I'm seeing people uh, drop out now. So I just want to say thanks to everybody. Be safe, healthy, and, and go sailing. Enjoy yourselves. We, we look forward to seeing you out on the water. Yeah, see see you somewhere cruising one day. Yeah, <laughs> looking forward to it. Yeah, thank, thank you, Vincent. You. Thank you, Waza. You guys are awesome. Thank yeah, you. Bye.